any further. Father, we're just uh, grateful this morning that we have you as our Father, and we're able to wake up, we're able to have this breath of life and to praise you because you've, uh, you have allowed it so. This morning we dedicate our lives to you and we welcome you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and continue to revive our spirits, that we will be repentant of sin, that we will be aware of your presence, that we will continue to pursue your kingdom with fervor. We just dedicate this time to you and uh, ask that you'd come and direct our thoughts, direct our day to the glory of your name. This new month, thank you for bringing us to a new month. And we thank you, Lord, for the exciting and adventurous time that we have in this new month. We just uh, come and uh, um, are anticipating your greatness and your move that will uh, show us great and mighty things that we do not know of. We thank you, Lord, for revival. We thank you, Lord, for souls that will be ushered into your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for your message that will build faith in us to believe that there is nothing impossible with you this morning. We bless and glorify your name, asking all these things. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. This morning, our theme uh, continues uh, um, around the word revival, how important it is for us to um, receive from God a fresh breath of life. Uh, and revival comes from his, his throne. And this morning, um, we're going to look at this word closely. And we... Um, will allow this word to resonate deep in our spirits so that we will uh, know what is in the heart of God. Unity, as we've uh, talked about in the past, is the key to the supernatural. When we look at the book of Acts, that is the vein or the main theme of the book of Acts, unity and one accord. The Bible says in verse 31, the place was shaken where they were assembled. The place was shaken where they were assembled. This is found in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. The Bible says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they speak the word of God with boldness. Praise God. I believe when we, the body of Christ, and that is the body of Christ across the board, everyone that calls the name of Jesus Christ Lord, when we unite ourselves in unity, and when we unite ourselves in the power of the word of God, something mighty will happen. There will be a shaking. We will uh, see the um, hand of God on display when the body of Christ comes together in unity in the power of the word of God. We're going to see some places shaken as they have never been shaken before. The reason the supernatural power of God has not been demonstrated as God would have liked in the years gone by is simply this. It's because believers got in unity or came together in unity only at times. I believe that in these last days, the end times revival before Christ's return will come again when the body of Christ comes into unity, unity that the world has never seen the body of Christ done. And this unity will be around the power of the word of God. And we will see the demonstration of the power of God like never before. His promises are 
yea and amen. And he says, where there is unity, he will command his blessings. Unity in seeking the heart of God. Unity in aligning ourselves with what is God's heartbeat. Not unity that is superficial, not unity that is man-made. It's unity in the cry of the heart of men being synchronized with the cry of the heart of God, the desire that lies in the heart of God. What is God's desire? God's desire is written in his will, which is his word that is before us. His desire is to see mankind saved. His desire is to see mankind transformed into his image and into his likeness. His desire is to see mankind weep over sin and repentant over sin. The great Charles Finney said these words, and I'd like to quote. Charles Finney was a revivalist. He said these words, Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. It is giving up one's will to God in deep humility. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24? He says, if you want to come after me, Anyone who wants to come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. No one can follow Christ successfully unless they do these two things, denying selfish desires, taking on God's desires, picking up their cross. What is the cross? The cross is always a decision a decision that we make, not between good and bad, but with, between good and God. It's giving up the good to pursue God. Because the good things are usually things that are comfortable, things that we um, love, things that we love to have. But if it comes between us and God, which one are we going to choose? Are we going to choose our desires, which are good, our happiness, the pursuit of our own um, selfish vision, or we're going to pursue the desire and the heart of God? The desire and the heart of God is the decision. This decision is one we make daily to rise up and pray or to sleep. Sleep is good. It's good for the body, people say. It's good for rest. But when it comes to the junction of choice, are we going to choose to sacrifice sleep so that we will come in unity with the heart of God, so that we will see repentance from sin, that we will see the, the walls of darkness broken, that we will see people in darkness coming to the light. So when Jesus said denying self and picking up our cross to follow him, it is the choice between good and God. It is the choice of the churches and the body of Christ putting aside doctrinal issues as long as the basic doctrine is based on the word of god we must recognize the whole body of christ even though we do not see eye to eye with uh, certain groups on, on on petty idiosyncrasies what are these idiosyncrasies some of the men may um wear long hair in certain churches. They may come in jeans and shirt and, and no tie. That does not matter. That is a petty issue. Some love to wear necktie and, and, and full suit and, 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 and fleshy suits. Um, 
That's okay. It does not need to divide us. Some wear shorts and, and bullshit and, and, and some uh, just dress casually. That is not a big issue. Some uh, put emphasis on women wearing makeup and women not wearing makeup. These are not big issues, but many times denominationally, we make it a big issue. And we come together, putting all these differences aside that are not salvation issues and having this idea of laboring together. Putting aside these incidentals, we unite ourselves on the word of God to fight this last day onslaught of the enemy. Because Satan is going to bring every power from the depths of hell, ladies and gentlemen, against God's people. And all humanity, he is going to throw everything, the spanner into the woodworks. The word of God says he has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. John 10.10. 10. Satan knows that his time is short and he's going to give it everything he's got. It's time that the body of Christ rise up and know the times and the seasons, that time is running short and that we do the same thing and give our 110% into this great harvest. So as we, as we band together as a body of Christ in the unity of the word of God, this powerful body that Christ established and said that the gates of hell will not prevail against will rise. And that's the beauty. This body of Christ will triumph. It will rise with power and it will win. In the end analysis, we win because the devil has already been defeated. Now, one person may say, oh, I'm a follower of this denomination. I'm a follower of that denomination. This reminds me of what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 to 9. He said, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Verse 4 says, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? He's saying, are ye not fleshy? These are just human beings. Verse 5 says, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? They are just mere ministers by whom ye believe, channels of blessing, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God, but God gave the increase. Never forget that. It's not this denomination or that denomination that's gifted. God gifted them in different giftings, but at the end of the day, God gives the increase. It's not the individual. It's not the human being. We come together and God gives the increase. Verse 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. God is the main one. God remains the hero in all of this. No human being. We are just mere servants, humble servants of the Most High. Verse 8 says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We're just laborers. Never overthink things. Never exalt ourselves no matter how mighty god uses us we are not any better than anybody else we have been called to run our lane when this idea settles in our spirit and we come united to see god's desires 
rolled out and not our personal agendas, not our personal kingdoms, not our personal empires, you will see God's hand move in a mighty way because the Lord is still our shepherd. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter who brought you the gospel. As long as you were saved by the blood, by the power and the lordship of Jesus Christ, no matter who brought you into the faith, whether you came through this person or, or that pastor or, or this denomination or that denomination, you and I are not following men. We are disciples of Christ. We are followers of Christ. We are following the word of God. The word of God is Christ. The doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also said, but though we or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. Notice here in Galatians that Paul even includes himself in that statement. Too many people have things out of perspective. For revival to be a revival, God is going to align our perspective with his perspective. Remember, it's always God's perspective. That's the main perspective because he's the author of this journey. This is his work. At the end analysis, he alone is glorified. People have taken a revelation that God has given them and grabbed the portion of it, ran off, and perverted it. God is never at fault. It is men. We are broken. And we take a bit of this and a bit of that. And when we pervert it, we try to build our own empire. A name for ourselves. Let's forget about human personalities. And let's just lift up the word of Christ. If we are to see end times revival, it is the body of Christ coming together in unity. And you find that this is something that is hard to do because we are still in the flesh. If we are to see end times revival, Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. Notice, if a personality is lifted up, if a denomination is lifted up, nothing will happen. It is only for a time. But if Jesus Christ is lifted up, that is the path where unity must come into, where Christ is paramount, not any human being. Not any doctrine, not any human wisdom. We must forget about our own ministries and fellowships being lifted up and lift up the head of the church, Jesus Christ. We must forget about who we are and what we stand for and what we boast about. We must unite ourselves around the word of God. Because the Bible reminds us time and again that the word of God is active. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It has the ability to divide soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Even the dividing, discerning of the thoughts of the heart. We must unite ourselves around the word of God. And as we do this, we will see ourselves ushered into the age of the supernatural power of God. Because Jesus promised in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said these words, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. You know, we have yet to see all these greater works to be accomplished. Why? Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has failed to unite. Therefore, 
the power of God has been unable to move. It's like a drain pipe that is clogged somewhere where the Spirit of God wants to flow. But because of this unity, there is this clog. But where there is unity, every gift of the Spirit, every fruit of the Spirit will be in operation. Then and only then can the supernatural power of God move. Do you know why most people are not in unity and harmony? Do you know why denominations are not in unity and harmony? Because they don't have enough of the word of God, enough power in them this morning. How can the gifts of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit operate in them? I wrote something on our Bible page the other day that the word of God must be alive in us. Too many Christians have forgotten Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where the fruit of the Spirit is listed. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. All of these need to be in demonstration. We need spiritual discipline, church. A lot of us want to talk about faith. We want to talk about our confession and, and what they have through their confession. However, what we do not talk about often is the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. Faith is not judged by the talk. Faith is judged by the fruit we bear. And so this morning, as we come together, revival will happen when we as individuals unite in seeing the desire of God's heart becoming paramount. When Christ is lifted up, he said, I will draw all flesh unto myself. The body of Christ needs to hear this. One of the connotations of love, or one connotation that love, the word love carries, is discipline. People don't like to hear the word discipline. People like to, to just flow, but the word discipline is omitted. If you come to see what the word of discipline is, or what, what the meaning or the definition of the word discipline is, the word discipline is to deny oneself and to make a decision to choose God over good. Spiritual discipline is one such thing where we put our hands to the plow and not step back as a church, as a small church. When the call comes out for us to rise up together, it's no one stepping back. It's everyone you will know where there is unity when people's heart is toward the word of God. It's toward doing the work because it is what God's word demands. Spiritual unity is standing together. Spiritual discipline is picking up where you need to pick up and exert yourself. I think it's time for us to quit having spiritual excuses. It's time for us to reach down into the word of God as individuals and exalt the word of God. Whatever the word convicts us of, by his spirit, we must repent, rise up, and do just as God instructs us to do. The apostle Paul uh, was telling Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, I think it's time that we come into the unity of the word of God concerning 
salvation, concerning the Holy Spirit, concerning healing, concerning faith, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. We need to come into unity in biblical theology and many other things, but particularly coming together with one passion, and that is to see God's desire, God's will being done on earth just as it is in heaven. It starts with the small things, our service in our local churches, raising our hands without fear. When fear comes against you, it's easy to stay in your comfort zone, which is the fear zone. But when you decide to pick up your cross, it's to make a decision to jump out of your comfort zone into your uncomfortable zone. Make the mistakes that are necessary for learning. And move on in the things of God. The Bible says when you lift Christ in this way, spiritual discipline, you will begin to see revival happen in your life as an individual. A lot of people are talking about the Holy Spirit these days. But let me tell you something. There are a lot, of, a lot more people talking about the Holy Spirit more than those who are actually experiencing the infilling of the Holy Spirit. How do you uh, get the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Step out by faith. Open your mouth, the Bible says, and I will fill it. When it's time to pray in tongues, don't step back and say, I don't know how to do it. Open your mouth, and God said, I will fill it. Because when you and I are truly born again, there is a change in our lives. There is a change in our attitude. When you and I have truly experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit, there is a change in our lives. Holy boldness and supernatural power, the power of God becomes resident. And then we are quickly discerning and we are spiritually aware of, of what God is doing. There is no fear in us. So this morning, as we are about to go into prayer, I pray that the word of God will be paramount in our lives. When the word of God says something, you believe it and you disregard every other thing. The great Smith Wigglesworth said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That settles everything in us about our situation, no matter how bleak, no matter how hopeless in the eyes of men it may look. If the word of God says that it is possible, then we stick to the word of God. That is uniting our hearts with the word of God. The word of God says that he wants his kingdom to be established here on earth. Salvation, healing, in filling of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit being born. Let's see that happen as we come together in prayer. When we come together in prayer, it is so that the Word of God will be exalted above all others. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all flesh unto myself. When that type of boldness begins to grip our spirits, we know that the word of God is working and revival is flowing. So this morning, right where you are, as you allow the word of God to engulf your spirit, as we go into prayer, you know that the word of God is like a hammer, the Bible says, that breaks the rocks in twain. It breaks walls into smithereens. Breakthrough comes when the word of God is lifted up. Breakthrough comes when the word of God becomes the treasure of our individual lives. When the word of God, not denominational doctrines, not while these things are important, they are not the most important. What is most important is the word of God being treasured, not being argued, but being treasured and implemented in our lives. The change must happen first in our lives as individuals. And when that happens, you will find the spirit of God flowing again like it's never done before. So this morning, as we come together to pray in tongues, 
it's amazing because when we pray in tongues, we're praying the heart of God. And isn't that what we're after? We'd rather have the heart of God, the desire of God's heart being implemented, not our personal desires. When you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. So this morning, let's take care of God's desires. He might want us to be praying for someone in, in Europe, someone in South America, someone who, who needs a breakthrough or a group that needs a breakthrough or an unreached people's group that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we align ourselves with that, how do we align ourselves with that? Pray in tongues. Because pray in tongues, we, we override our personal biases. Because you find when you pray in, in known tongue, you have this uh, urgency to pray for your own need and for things that matter to you. But when we pray in tongues, the Bible says we talk directly to God and we allow the Spirit of God to pray through us. And he, he, the Holy Spirit prays the perfect will of God because no one knows the Spirit of God except, no one knows the heart of God except the Spirit of God. And so this morning, as we allow ourselves to be vessels used by the Spirit of God to voice the heart of God back to God, we find that things will begin to break out in our lives that we've never seen before. When we pray in tongues, it's a laundry mat where we cleanse ourselves from within and we build our most holy faith. We operate from a place of peak faith. It begins to cleanse our, our mortal bodies. When we begin to activate the spirit of God, Jesus said, uh, Paul said, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, the same spirit will also resurrect your mortal bodies. Whatever sickness disease that may exist as you pray in tongues the spirit of god will begin to renew every organ in your being so that the will of god can be carried out so that the will of god can be displayed when you pray in tongues you are rejuvenating yourself and cleansing yourself by the washing through the word ephesians 5 20 says the addictions that you once struggled with will begin to be a thing of the past when you pray in tongues. It may sound funny, and when it's unfruitful to the mind, you know you are on the right track. You may laugh at yourself now and again when you think you're just going through one syllable and everybody else is lacing a sentence in tongues. That's okay. One syllable in the physical can be a thousand words in the spiritual. You know, God does not contradict his word, but he is comfortable contradicting our understanding of his word. And he says, when you call unto me, I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. You don't know. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the minds of men what God has prepared for his people. God has so much more prepared for us. And as we pray in tongues, we begin to traverse the spiritual realm that is our realm as spirit beings. And we begin to experience things that we've never experienced before. And so this morning, as we pray in tongues, I want you to uh, open, unmute your mics, and in unity, let's pray in tongues. If you don't know how to pray in tongues, pray in tongues. That's the best way I can describe it. Open your mouth and utter the syllable that the Spirit of God will give through your spirit and to, through your mind. Utter it and see God. Take it and use it for his glory. You see, the heart is the main thing. How is your heart aligned? If your heart is aligned with God's heart, it's toward God. Everything in that vicinity becomes holy. Everything in that vicinity becomes his. So I'm not